Uh, well, uh, I was going to talk to today a little bit about Pathfinder verification validation. Um, when I originally um, put in the abstract for this talk, even to our own little process, we thought we would talk, uh, do a pretty data intensive thing comparing our verification tests and showing you all the data and regurgitate everything. But um, the more things went along and the more time I spent trying to organize the conference and less time I spent actually working on, on some of this work, um, it became a little bit more of an overview. And I think I'll just kind of give you a sense of what we do. It's sort of similar to the talks you've seen with uh, uh, FDS and their testing process. I'm going to talk a little bit about our process and a little bit about how we've applied that to some of our development problems in the last couple of years. Um, it's good to finally get up here and say hi to everybody after organizing things. I've been kind of hiding over with the AV Club. We do have about 25 people around the world uh, live streaming, um, and we've had some issues with the hotel internet making that happen. But um, So with that, uh, just talk a little bit about our process. Um, as was mentioned in, in some of the other things, it's just kind of modern software development practice now to do things like you've heard continuous integration. You know, we use source code control to track changes to our software, whether it's Pyrosome or Pathfinder for that matter. Um, we're continuously um, verifying that work in many ways. Uh, first of all, just to make sure when somebody checks in a change to some complicated bit of code that all the code still works and it didn't break something. And then to verify that it still works the way it was supposed to. Um, so anytime somebody checks something in, the, the system we have, I, I'll try to avoid using the word bot. I heard, we heard a lot about fire bots and test bots yesterday. Um, but it, it automatically, there's a system that automatically, you know, creates a clean, fresh copy of everything in a production environment and runs all the tests. Um, we have an automated system for Pathfinder that does this, um, and it runs automatically after every one of these continuous integration builds. And we continually are adding test cases, you know, mostly they're verification tests, um, because it is very difficult with evacuation to really get a handle on the validation side of things. But we're continuously adding. We're up to over 300 cases now that run, and it takes a significant amount of time to run some of these, even in an automated way. Um, internally, we have tools that help us see these things, a testing dashboard, and I'll give, show you some examples uh, in a couple seconds. And then um, automated reporting fits into this too. All of our software has a system where if it crashes, it probably won't, but sometimes <coughs> happens, um, it pops up a little box and says, hey, can we send this information to Thunderhead? And you can do that anonymously or, or add an email address if you'd like to help us figure out what was going on. But we collect all that, and every week we review what everything came in. We, we, uh, review things for severity, and that's part of the whole quality process and feeds back into, okay, where do we have a problem? Um, that's not so much a verification, although you know the software needs to work and continue running to actually uh, give you answers. Um, so if some of you aren't familiar with source control or development practices, um, it's, it's really fairly simple. It's just a database of tracking everything that happens with what you do in your software development process. So this is just kind of an example that shows you know, we can pick any section of our code and look at who has changed things over time and what changes have been made and by whom and what was done. And then if we find out with a new bug report that something in the latest version caused a problem, we can go back and see when that problem was introduced if it was in existing code. Um, and there's many ways to do that. For an individual file, you can see its inheritance and how it, it has, uh, it's genealogy almost and how it's moved throughout the different code in, in Thunderhead. And for every file, for every specific change in the bottom here, this is like showing you an example for a revision of a file. You know, there's just one method that's been changed. And it makes it very easy to track all this and maintain quality um, through the process. And I mentioned the testing dashboard. You know, for all of those 300 some odd tests, we can look for the last uh, published release, our last internal release, and the last build last night, the last continuous build what the status of these tests are and, and how they um, compare to the accepted result that we've coded in to compare against. Um, there's a lot of other things going along with this. Um, as I think um, we learned from some of the talks yesterday, one of the more important things, because it is different, difficult to validate, I mean, we've kind of tried to take the approach that transparency is one of the most important things we can do. You know, it, we know that we don't get everything right, but we try to be clear in between our verification validation document and our technical reference in how we do things. I mean, we try not to have a lot of trade secrets. I mean, we do try to do things better than other people, but I, I think in this, mob, this problem space, we have to be forthcoming in how we're coming up with these answers or it's just not gonna be uh, credible. Um, so we try to make as much of that available as possible so that you can determine for yourself how this works. And this was just a picture of what I discussed earlier, where if it crashes, you'll be presented with this. It might look like nonsense to you, but it's very helpful to us in determining uh, uh, what happened. Um, and I know 
Dan is always asking us, did somebody send their email with this? <laughs> he almost wants us to require that you give your email to send in these crash reports. Well, I know that's a privacy issue for many people, but it really does help. We don't use that to spam people. We really just use it to say, hey, can you help us figure out exactly what you were doing that caused this particular problem? So, you know, uh, it was discussed yesterday a little bit too, where does all this data come from to do verification? You know, there's a lot of sources, but they're all quite verification oriented. You know, the IMO uh, came from maritime industry. There's a lot of tests in there. They're very much about if you tell your model to have a person walk one meter per second, does he actually walk one meter per second? Does he do that in, the, you know, um, in all cases? Um, the Ramea test and many of the NIST tests are very similar as well. The, the recent NIST, NIST tech note adds some, some more things that relate to behavior. But until, in Pathfinder specifically, until we add more robust grouping or other sorts of individual behaviors, a lot of that doesn't apply to us yet from a verification standpoint. And even um, with Pathfinder, since we kind of have a couple of different modes that we can run in, we can use an SFPE set of assumptions where basically the door flows and, and speeds through rooms in open space are controlled by the, the handbook calculations. Um, we also do some verifications based on that, like, you know, make sure we can reproduce some of the examples from the SFPE handbook for the, on the chapter on uh, movement. So basically the verification tests we do fall into a few basic categories. Um, for the, just making sure the model works the way it's supposed to, um, there's locomotion tests, which are like that, does the person go one meter per second when you tell him to. Um, for our, particularly for our steering and even for the SFPE, for determining what is the shortest path, if that's the assumption we're working on, are we calculating that correctly? Are we otherwise um, uh, selecting the way out uh, properly uh, based on the inputs that we're given? And similarly for behavior. Um, like I said, we don't have uh, incredibly complicated behavior right now, but a lot of our behavior is handled in a room by room in what we call our locally quickest algorithm, which is kind of a cue balancing uh, behavior. And so we have to verify that, that kind of behavior too. So I thought I was gonna, like I said, you know, come up here with a bunch of numbers and show everything compares, but I thought it would be a little bit more interesting, um, particularly uh, to, to see what these tests actually look like. They're actually pretty boring. You know, here's like an IMO test of an occupant, and if, if we were to show you the actual, you know, printed output data from this, you'd see that he's walking at the speed we told him to walk. You know, and they have that, we can tell him to go at a different speed for instance. And then this actually also helps us verify that, hey, now he's moving a couple meters per second, so let's animate him like he's running instead of like a guy just floating along past faster. And that's not in the IMO, but that helps us know if our software is doing what we intend it to do. Um, the IMO tests are very broadly like this. There's, you know, are people going upstairs at the right rate? Are people going downstairs at the right rate? Um, and then there's other behavioral tests that, that don't necessarily come from a source like IMO or in this tech guide, but you know, if, if this occupant is heading to the door on the right, does he take a reasonable path? There's no great answer to that, but everybody kind of has their own opinion of does it look right or not. So we have tests that have a person follow around a path to an exit. Um, when we get sort of bored with super simple test problems, occasionally developers come up with something like a great death spiral and the guy just, you know, this is played it. You know, a lot of these will be at, at, at high speed just because it makes the video go a little bit quicker. But um, so th these 300 tests fall into a lot of these categories. A lot of times we can do multiple tests at once. Like here's one with varying door widths and hallway widths. And you can see how everything empties and we verify that it empties in the right order for the size of the hallways. Um, likewise, here's a test where we get to the, like I said, with wayfinding. A lot of the tests end up looking kind of strange like this because it's a lot easier to verify that something works with, with a synthetic uh, geometry. There's some occupants here in this room and they're heading for this exit up here and basically if they take this path, um, it's quite a bit shorter than this one which is uh, five times longer, right? So we verify that everybody goes the right way. Um, Similarly here, this kind of shows if this is broken up into multiple rooms as opposed to one room with multiple triangles. There's sort of multiple things going on here, but um, people are offset slightly in the top and they're uh, not in the bottom. So you see that in one they go opposite directions because it's a symmetric problem and the other one they don't. Um, but that's just to give you a flavor of how all of these work. You know, there's uh, interaction things to make sure occupants don't get stuck on each other. Can they move around and avoid one another? Um, and likewise, do they all flow to 
um, and a assigned exit, for instance. In this model, a certain percentage of the of the occupants are assigned to each of these three separate exits, and we verify that the right percentages go to those exits. And as I said, this is all covered in the, the VNV document if you want to see the actual numbers. I just thought it'd be more interesting to show you the behaviors. Um, and again, in some of the ones where there isn't great data, it's like, well, counterflow. I mean, some of the, some of the uh, verification uh, guidance documents talk about it a little bit, but it's more, can it do it or, or can it not? And it's not as much, do you get it right? Because we don't absolutely know what right is. So we have tests like this that show everybody sort of passing through and yeah, we can do some counterflow. We know it's probably not ideal, um, but it demonstrates the capability. Uh, similarly, this one's actually a uh, uh, <coughs> visible re recreation of, of one of the SFPE hand calculations where you know it's got a description of the problem but no actual geometry. So we've sort of recreated it. Okay, it's five floors, so many people for, per floor with certain stairways. And they're actually not even realistic stairways because the doors enter directly from the, the rooms and there's no additional landing there, but that's the way it's described in the handbook. So we, we make the model match and just verify that everybody can flow out. And again, in the end, this looks at clearing times of each floor and the total clearing times um, for, the, for the entire model. You see some people swapping back and forth up there. That's part of what I'm going to talk about a little bit later on, estimating um, Q choice within a, in a room that you're in. Um, so I'd like to go from here and talk a little bit of how do we use this verification data or this process in our day-to-day -day process, in our development process. Uh, how does this help the developers get work done or verify that they're, they're doing the right thing as we go? So I wanted to talk of quickly about a couple of uh, particular cases. Um, one of them is dealing with uh, we were looking at door flows, and, and both of these examples are probably from the 2012 to 2013 time frame when we were coming up with those releases of Pathfinder. And um, at the time we were looking at door flows, um, partly based on some user feedback um, that in our steering or individual agent mode, the flows are somewhat higher than they were in the SFPE assumption mode, and there was a request to uh, be able to limit door flows in the agent mode. Um, there's multiple reasons you might like to do that. Um, one is to, if you want to just th throttle those rates to be closer to an SFP assumption, or perhaps you want to model something else like a turnstile or something that has a, a fixed rate. But as we were looking at that, we were trying to evaluate and look deeper into what the sensitivities are for, um, for outputs like the flow through a door. And um, in our agent mode, the, the flow through a door really comes up from sort of lower level principles the way we've we've tried to, to code the agent mode. It's based on you know, how quickly someone moves, what their body size is, what their uh, personal space is. All that kind of interacts into how quickly do people manage to get through a door. And it's in a non completely intuitive or um, clear way in terms of how do you know uh, which of those factors has a bigger impact. So we, we're looking at this and we particularly started looking at the acceleration number we, we had used. We use a fairly simple model that when, a, when an agent begins from rest, they use a constant acceleration up to their free walking speed. It's simplified in that you know, they're just accelerating at a constant rate and then moving at a constant speed. Um, but that makes it easy to, to implement. Um, but when you're looking out there in the literature for things like these low-level mechanical properties, there's not an overwhelming amount of data out there. And there's certainly not consensus of this is the right answer. And like anything else with with human properties, there's a huge variation. Um, one thing we did found that was, that was actually I found kind of interesting was a paper in the this Problems of Forensic Sciences by this uh, group of Polish authors. And it was basically, I think, the, the intent of the, of the journal in this particular paper was for litigation purposes. They were curious how quickly does a person step out in front of a car um, where you're having vehicle and pedestrian accident things. So they had done a series of tests with about 54 subjects, I believe it was, about half male, half female, um, all middle-aged. And they had people start and walk in front of this sort of calibrated area, and then they basically could plot position and distance for each of these subjects. And their paper contained you know, a dozen graphs of, of all of the raw data, and then they just kind of drew bounds around the data, because like any of these other human factors, it's, it's kind of a cloud. I mean, it had clear trends, but 
Um, and they did this for people uh, speeding up to slow walking speed, ordinary walking speed, fast walking speed, running, and sprinting. So they had a, a, a large number of different tests that they had done with, this, uh, with these subjects. And but what we were interested in is fitting our simple model to this data and see you know, what kind of acceleration number comes out of this if you were to try to fit it with a constant acceleration. So in a crude and quick way, what I had done with this data is to just basically just digitize it with a quick click, click, click to turn the graph into some data um, rather than using all the raw data because it's just a cloud. Well, not just a cloud. I'm overstating that a bit. But anyway, and then just do a simple finite difference uh, derivative on this. So in the blue line here, I've, I've kind of flipped those curves around into what more like you'd be used to in high school physics class. We've got position on the left and time on the x-axis. Um, so the blue line is, is uh, for one of this was for the lower bound of ordinary walking. Um, and then the red line is the first derivative, so that's velocity. The green line is a mess. If you sort of blur your eyes, you, you can see uh, a trend through the data coming up and down. Uh, the, the jaggies are just because I hand digitized this data. And obviously, it's not once you get to the second derivative. You know, it's not very, very great anymore. But you can see from the trend of the, of the red here, it's actually, you know, it starts kind of flat and then the velocity increases more steadily and then levels off again. And that's consistent with the trend um, in this crude analysis of it. But, but if you take and fit this, this uh, increase in speed with a linear function, then you can get kind of what's your, con the slope of that line is what's your approximate acceleration. And we looked at this for all of these folks. And this one has like 0.9 meters per second squared. And, like all that data showed, it, it's actually pretty broad. I mean, if you look at these walking things, um, by the time this slope becomes fairly constant, it's probably close to two seconds for some of the slower walkers. But some of the, say for the sprinting, you know, it, it's maybe a fraction of a second that you've reached your full speed. And um, this is complicated because humans are very nonlinear beings. I mean, really, I mean, there's other data we've seen and that led to the original assumptions we had on acceleration is that many people reach their walking speed within one or two strides. So it's really, you know, if you really want to model this accurately, you need to do a nice bipedal model, you know, modeling the, you know, walking on two legs and the very nonlinear uh, pendulum swing type motion. And they're actually really cool computer graphics models about that. If you go out and look for some, I think there's a really cool one where they had done these simulations and where they chucking apples at these subjects, yeah, and it hits them and makes them react in, in a very realistic way. But that would never scale to the kinds of things that we need to do. You can't, that's very computer intensive to do for a couple of occupants, let alone 5,000 or 50,000. Um, so we were curious too. I mean, this data spread is so wide, and being developers and engineers, we're always like, well, how fast are we? So we just decided to step out in the hallway one afternoon, and we marked off, it's about a 30 meter, well, no, probably not 30 meter, but hallway, and we marked off five meters and 10 meters, and we started at one end, and we decided we'd just start with a stopwatch, and we'd speed up and try to walk steadily. Turns in the end, we had to make sure we walked steadily past the end of our thing, because otherwise everybody tries to slow down, anticipating the end of the, the, end of the little test. And we just tabulated ourselves, so, so how fast do we walk? And you know, so here we have a couple of developers, Richard and John and me and Charlie, and even we just have a regular Joe here too. It turns out there's an architect across the hall named Joe, and he was like, what are you guys doing? He's like, we're seeing how fast people walk. So he's like, hey, I'll do it. Um, what's kind of interesting is that, and then we broke this down, again, just a simple analysis. We took the last two times and assumed that you'd reached a constant velocity. So we, we, and we calculated the velocity from those times, and then we took the first the, the, the zero time and the first time, and using that known velocity fit, okay, what acceleration, constant acceleration, did they have to need to reach that velocity? So again, this is broken down. There's time one, time two, um, total time, and then we've got velocity. And I found it interesting that, you know, the SFPE number of 1.1, 1.2 for an average, yeah, it surprised, and this is, you know, obviously this isn't some great experiment. You can all tear me down on the setup and the analysis of this, but we were just trying to say, is it close? And uh, we were surprised, well, not surprised, but comforted by, you know, it, it is all pretty close. We're actually, as a group, generally faster, but this was all young and middle-aged male population. Um, and then from that, we calculated, as I said, this fit velocity or acceleration, which was kind of like the data from that earlier paper, pretty widely variable, um, you know, from as low as less than a meter per second, like on that slow walking on that other slide, up to several meters per second squared. And it turns out we convert this, we sort of 
non-dimensionalize this a little bit in Pathfinder because it's an easier input. We basically determine the seconds to reach your full walking speed, and that way it scales a little bit. So if you're intending to go to running and it takes you a second to get there, you're going to use a higher force and a higher acceleration, and that kind of matches the general trend in the, the data you see out there. Um, so in the end, but even then, our, our old default, I think, had been uh, 0.5, and uh, we saw that, you know, just based on this really crude experiment, our data ranged from as, as fast as, you know, a fraction of a second to reach full velocity to slow as uh, one to one and a half. Um, so with an average right around one. Again, this isn't, you know, you obviously can't take this data even to probably a decimal point, but, but we just thought it was interesting and it helped the developers understand, you know, we've got this cloud of data. And, and in our job, and what it, we realized too is in the earlier versions, this number we had just used a number from the literature that seemed reasonable and that was just how it worked and that was documented in the technical reference. But we decided at this point that really this probably needed to be a, an exposed parameter just because there's sensitivity to it and there's such a broad range. You know, we're not the authority on is 0.5 the right number or is 1 the right number or is 2 the right number. They all have a, an impact on how the model works and I think partly it's up to the, the practitioner to understand that and choose and either accept a value that we've chosen as the default or choose something of their own. Um, so here's a plot using um, the, the newer version where you can actually set this and it, this just shows kind of a uh, trend of the flow rate through a door, and I believe this was about a one meter door. It's a very simple test problem, but with faster accelerations and slower accelerations. And there is, you know, a fairly reasonable, I don't know if you can see the numbers here, but it goes from, you know, 1.75 at the low end here of persons per second per meter. And this is not taking into account a boundary layer or any sort of a comparison to an SFPE number. But you do see this trend down to, say, uh, less than a meter per second squared. And, and we ended up deciding and documenting in our, in our manuals that, well, maybe one second is a little bit better default than half a second. And it turns out that the original impetus of all this is the complaint that our, our flows are a little bit fast in uh, the steering mode was helped by this. So it made it a little bit more conservative. It slowed them down. They're still, they're much more agreeable with some SFPE numbers. But that's another one of those things that how do you even compare? Because in reality, we, you know, the SFPE gives you an idea of you know, 1.3 persons per meter of free area taking into account a boundary layer. Well, that's a continuous function. And the way it really works isn't like that. It's like you, know, you can make a, a three meter door 10 centimeters wider and it doesn't flow 3% you know, more people, really. There's kind of a point at which you can get another person through there and it's not a, as smooth a function as you might expect, so it's hard to compare directly. Um, so at the end of this, you know, how does this roll back into testing? Well, this is one of these things where we've made a conscious change in the way the simulator works and the way we expect the output to behave. So you know, we've exposed this parameter, we've documented that in our technical and validation documents, then we rerun all the verification problems and make sure it doesn't it has the effect we expected it to have and no other side effects and update our internal tests with a new expected result for that, that matrix of things. Um, for a second uh, case, we had another um, issue that we thought could be improved. Um, I think I spoke at the 2011 conference about our locally quickest, you know, choosing a queue in a room to get out. Um, and we had improved things at that time, but we decided we still weren't always entirely happy with the way that worked because, again, of these kinds of assumptions that it used. And here's, again, kind of a synthetic model with this sort of crazily packed room, but there's two exits here, one down here that's not too far, a few meters from the occupants, and then another one that's three times further away. And in this case, the, the way this worked to choose should these occupants use this door or this door is they basically looked how many people were in front of them in line and they used an assumption for the flow rate of that door and come up with a queue time in that room. And so they can decide, oh, I'm in a five minute queue here versus a two minute queue here and, and pick that way. And based on some omniscient knowledge that I'm gonna take a longer path if I go this way. And so there's a bit of an optimization there. Um, but the way that was behaving in the older version is that some of these folks in the back thought that they had a long wait, so they'd spin off. But all these other folks thought, oh, well, this is a really wide door and flowing at 1.3 people per second per meter, it's gonna go really fast. And they don't really take into account that there may be backups further down. Because while this door was wide, the next door further down was much lower and had a slower flow rate. And, 
since we really only look at local information in our model, that was why it worked the way it did. So, and this, this is just another example um, with a little bit more complicated, you know, the backup is not a smaller door, the backup is just there's a whole lot of people in the next space, but it's the same basic behavior. The folks down here, a few of them thought they were in the back of the line, but everybody else thinks it's going to go pretty quickly. Um, so how did we handle this? Uh, our proposed solution was, well, we recognized that this was kind of an optimistic assumption to say that, well, let's just use the optimum SFPE flow rate, which is kind of the peak of the curve anyway. And rather than say, okay, all doors are going to be assumed to flow at, have a queue time of number of people times 1.3 people per meter per second, that we calculate how fast is that door actually flowing based on just a simple assumption that, okay, if I look at that queue, I can decide if it's moving or not. And that's what we're trying to capture without actually putting an AI in of there of, oh, I see it's not moving. So we assumed that we would uh, look at the flow rates over time. So then that became, so what we want to do is turn this problem on the left where he says, oh, I've only got two people and they'll get right through this door to, oh, there's two people and they haven't gone anywhere in the last 20 seconds. So this, uh, I'm better off taking a longer route. So to do that, we had to measure the flow rate at the doors as being calculated within uh, Pathfinder. The complication with this is that it's not really just a simple function. It's, a, it's essentially a train of impulses. Somebody goes through at a point in time, or two people go through in a window. I mean, it's really all these just events that happen. So how do you, how do you turn this into a flow rate that's meaningful and usable in these calculations without making things swing and think, oh, there's nobody, you know, the flow rate's zero now, and all of a sudden, oh, it's two people per second. Um, so what, the obvious answer is to use some sort of a moving average, a windowed moving average, where you say for the last 10 seconds how many people have gone through, and you can turn that into a people per second and march that through. And as impulses come and go out of that window, you come up with a, a flow rate. Um, that works pretty well, but it still has this sort of digital, digital element to it, and then it's not a smooth curve, which can then wreak havoc. You don't want things to happen in the simulator where people pop back and forth because numbers are changing. Um, so we ended up using... Um, at the time, I had been messing with a bunch of musical things and trying to write uh, uh, a tuner algorithm for a phone that would take a digital signal and then break it down and do this uh, transcorrelation. So I had my head in all these, these digital algorithms. And uh, Richard and I were sitting together and think, well, why don't we use a low-pass filter for this? Because it has the effects of if you see this impulse train, it can create a value that rises up because you know, there's lots of people going through. And then it, as no people go through, it comes back down. It has this sort of behavior. Um, so we used uh, what's called a bi-quad filter, an infinite, Im infinite impulse response filter, um, that it turns out is even quicker to, t to do than go back and say how many people went through in this last 10 seconds, because you just take the last couple of bits of digital data and you can carry it forward with a moving average with weights. And it's very elegant and it works well. And you can tune it to actually be the same as a 10 second window to average or 5 or 20. Uh, and I believe we ended up using a, a tuning that was very similar to that 10 second moving average we showed a minute ago. But this is it implemented with a filter. And it's kind of hard to see here, but it's a lot more of a smooth function. I mean, they're both continuous, but this one has better properties for actually getting a stable flow rate through the door. Um, turns out we actually use this too in our post processing, because by tweaking some of the filter parameters, you can quickly re average your data and look at it on different sort of time windows, which is useful for post processing as well. So, in the end, with using that new piece of information inside our algorithm, you can now see that if we run these people, these people at the back know that it's going to take a long time to get out here because they know that queue is not flowing very quickly. And so now it's a much more even. And there's a few people at the back that are kind of constantly reevaluating. We try to avoid that sort of flipping back and forth decision making. Um, and here it is on the other test case as well. And similarly, you'll see that these people. And again, what we were going for when we looked at these models is that, well, we had this queue balancing algorithm, but sometimes it just didn't look right. You think, oh, that occupant is being stupid. And it just looks a little bit better now. So, it, And again, there's no perfect answer for how these people are going to behave. And for this is certainly not taking into account any things like signage or direction. But it's just for a simple test case, does it feel a little bit more applicable than it did before? Um, but then like before, this changed things quite a bit in terms of how people get out, in terms of exit utilization. So it was the same sort of process. Rerun all of our verifications, make sure we didn't introduce any unknown side effects, update our expected results, et cetera. Um, so with that, I think that's all I had to talk about today. So do we have questions for the speaker?